All right. Hey, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, I know it's been a little bit of a little while since I've made a video, but um, this video is going to be all about free response, some tips and tricks for it. Um, we're going to go through just kind of the basics. Some of this stuff, um, you know, really applies to the FRQs um, as they were originally made, keeping in mind that, you know, the AP exam this year is a little bit different. Um, they are still the same FRQs. They're just slightly modified for the updated um, exam. So just keep in mind for this year, there are going to be two questions. You're going to get 25 minutes for question one and then 15 minutes for question two. Um, it's the only part of the exam. There is no multiple choice. Hopefully you know that by now. And the two types are going to be design and inv investigation. And then the second question is going to be analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution. Um, the original AP exam with the FRQs, the third type of, of uh, question was going to be to analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution using calculations. So in theory, there should not be math on the AP exam. So there has been quite a lot that has shown us that that's probably going to be the case. So some general tips, if you're going to be writing your test um, in, by hand, make sure that you write legibly. They will not read it if it's not readable. So you know who you are. You can practice writing legibly, um, not writing in cursive. I would highly recommend if you do write in cursive, it's harder to read. I know some of you write in cursive and think that it looks great, but I'm going to tell you right now, um, your cursive is not always the best. Uh, if you're going to write it, usually you'd use blue or black ink. Um, I believe because you guys are technically, if you're writing it by hand, you're going to take a picture of it and upload it. So I think if you wrote in pencil, you'd be okay. I do still recommend that you just cross out mistakes with a line and uh, try to avoid jumbling stuff together and adding in words. Um, obviously, the reason that you're going to want to continue to cross out your mistakes rather than erasing them if you're using a pencil is because you want to save time. Um, so I, I yeah. Uh, if you decide to type your responses, I would recommend doing it in a word editing program like Microsoft Word, but really what you're comfortable with. Uh, the reason being that you want to be using something that you've used before that's not going to come up with new tools that you don't know how to use. Um, and that would be helpful so that you can spell check and grammar check um, and do whatever else you might want to be able to do. You know, use synonyms, uh, use the thesaurus, that kind of thing. Um, I recommend that you type it if you feel comfortable typing. Uh, you want to avoid tree hugging, right? You don't want to go on and on about how important and lovely nature is. Keep in mind it is a science-based test, so you want to use detail that's specific and support uh, to back up your assessment. Nope. So just remember that not all impacts are created equal, and we'll go into these in, in particular uh, in a couple slides, but just remember that there are societal impacts, economic impacts, environmental impacts, human health impacts, and political. These are different, so they're not always going to be the same. So if it asks you what is a human health concern, you don't want to talk about something that might be environmental. So some more hints. Just remember the most points you're going to be able to get on the FRQ is 10 points. Once you've answered all the FRQs, you go back. You guys actually can't do that. So once you've answered your FRQ, the first one, for instance, I would recommend looking back and seeing or finding where those points are coming from. Now, because the um, questions are different, I don't know for sure if they're going to be like this where you're going to actually have 10 points. For instance, question one might be worth 13 points and question two might be worth eight points because one of them's longer and one of them's shorter. So you want to do your best to try and find points, but I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about that. The biggest thing is counting the points with the questions. So if it asks you to explain two things, you're going to have two points. If it says to identify and describe two things, identify and describe, that's two points, two things, twice. So you're going to have four whole points there. 
Um, question, answers should be in complete sentences. You will not get credit for incomplete sentences. So I just recommend that you write it in a complete sentence. If it says to identify, you're being very quick and simple. It's one sentence, but you do want to write it in a complete sentence. You don't want to answer with one super paragraph. Label your answers, 1A, 2C. We've done this all year with our practice problems, um, with the practice FRQs. You want to make sure that you are clearly labeling where the question is being answered. I also recommend leaving a space in between like 1A and 1B so that it's obvious where 1A stops and where the reader can start 1B. You're, you're, you always got to remember that you are making or writing this FRQ to be graded by a person and you want to make it as easy as possible for them to grade it because the easier it is for them to grade, the better chance you're going to get a good score. And remember that most of the people that are uh, grading you are environmentalists, so you usually want to go for the answer that is best for the environment unless it asks you to do otherwise. So you usually know what the best choice should be. Some more tips. Um, that's weird. Don't answer a question with it's bad for the environment or it causes air pollution or it'll harm biodiversity. Those responses are incredibly vague. You have to detail and explain why is it bad for the environment or how is it bad for the environment? How will it harm biodiversity? You don't want to say pollution because any third grader could just say pollution. You have to be specific. So if you're talking about pollution, talk about that specific chemical that's going to be polluting or talk about the type of pollution. You don't want to just say it pollutes. You should say it will pollute using, or it will, you know, increase the amount of carbon dioxide into the air or it'll increase the amount of NOx in the air. You want to show the grader that you know some of those science facts because you do. I, I, we've, we've gone through a whole year. You know a lot more than you think you do. If you use a term, you want to make sure that you define it. So if you use eutrophication, make sure to just give a brief what eutrophication is. You have to assume that the reader doesn't know what those terms are, and you're proving to them that you're not just putting in these words that you heard, but you have no idea what it means. So again, being specific with pollution, what you mean. So air pollutants would be sulfur dioxide or ozone. Water pollution could be sediment, metals, or nutrients. And remember that there's no detail that's too small as long as it's part of the topic. So the you know giving good detail is a good thing. Now here are the verbs you're going to see for these uh, FRQs. Okay, calculate. When it says to calculate, you're going to perform a mathematical steps to arrive at a final answer, including the algebraic expressions, properly substituted numbers, and correct labeling of units. You want to make sure that you show your work because it is required. Now, I don't know for sure if there will be calculations on the AP exam or not. They are not being incredibly clear. I've heard from some sources that there won't be, but I've heard from others that there's a possibility that there will be. So just be prepared. If there's math, it's not going to be incredibly difficult. Um, so don't you know fret it too much, but just make sure that you show your work, show the steps that you take, and label your units. If you see describe, you're going to be providing the relevant characteristics of the topic. Explain is a little bit more than describe. When you're explaining, you're providing information about how or why the relationship, the process, the pattern, positions, whatever it is, you're explaining why or how that relationship occurs using evidence or reasoning. If it says to explain how, you're usually looking at the relationship, that process, whatever it is, and you're explaining how it does something, where if, it, if it's looking at why, you're analyzing the motivations or reasons of the relationship. Why does it exist? Sometimes you'll see this uh, written as give one reason, that's the same as explain. Some more of those task verbs that you might see. Identify, this is the simplest. If you see identify, it's very quick. You're indicating or providing information about a topic. You're not elaborating, you're not explaining, you're just identifying it. You're just saying what it is. So if the question asks, you know, if, if it's a question about um, increase of nutrients into the lake, causing dissolved oxygen levels to drop, 
identify the process being described in this example. You would just say eutrophication is what is occurring. And then justify is where you're going to provide evidence to support or qualify or defend a claim and or provide reasoning to explain how the evidence supports the claim. So when you're justifying, you're using evidence and a claim and you're combining them and explaining how your evidence and uh, helps your claim. And then making a claim is just making an assertion based on evidence or knowledge. Evidence being if there's some kind of data or there's um, a, a, an experiment, you're using that as your evidence. Knowledge would be knowing what things, you know, certain things, how we know that if there's an increase in, of certain pollutants from cars in the presence of sunlight, we see photochemical smog. So you can make a claim based on that knowledge, but you want to explain the knowledge or the evidence that you're using in your claim. And then proposing a solution. This is something that we did. We did this for a um, one of our tests. Instead of a test, we did that uh, solution to pollution. And this is just providing a proposed solution to a problem, again, with evidence or knowledge. So you're not just saying some random solution. You have to be able to say that this solution could work because of some kind of evidence or knowledge. So you should be able to explain why the solution will work. Some more hints, don't skip any of the parts of the FRQ. At the end of the day, if you have no idea how to answer one part, write something that might be right. Try your best. Leaving it blank is a guarantee that you won't get a point. Putting something in there that could be correct is a way better chance. Remember that if it says to give two reasons, only the first two things that you write will be graded. If it says two reasons and you write 20 things, and the first two are wrong and everything else, the other 18 are right, you will not get any points because they will only grade the first two things. If it says one reason, they're only gonna grade the first thing. So if it says give one example of something and you give three examples and the first example you give is wrong, but the next two are correct, you're gonna get no points. If it says to identify and describe two reasons, this is the example I was giving you guys a little bit earlier you're gonna need about four sentences for the first reason and another four sentences for the second because you're going to identify, that's gonna be your first sentence, and then you usually take about three reasons or three sentences to explain those two reasons or to explain and describe that identification. So that's four sentences and then your second reason. So identify and describe two reasons, that's four points right there. And when we're talking about an FRQ that's worth 10 points, that's 40% of the FRQ. So you want to make sure that you spend a good amount of time on something that's asking you to do four things, essentially. Don't restate the question. Uh, we've talked about this before. You're not giving an opening paragraph or a conclusion. It's not an English essay. It's free response. Short answer, complete answer, complete sentence. If the question asks something, don't start by rephrasing the question in your answer because by doing that you're wasting time the grader already knows what the question is they're they're grading it yeah they know what the question was you don't have to remind them it's just answer the question and then make sure to pace yourself right because we're taking this online um, it's there's a timer that's going to be built in so you can use the timer help yourself keep track of your timing if you don't need, if you don't want to use the timer, I think they said that it's going to be able to, you can uh, hide it, but I would recommend using the timer. Be aware of your time. Know that if you have this much time and there's this many questions, how much time should I spend on each part of the question? Now, this is back to that not all uh, costs are equal. If it asks for an environmental benefit or a cost, you're talking about animals, plants, soil, air, Etc. When we are talking about environmental issues, we are not talking about humans. So in environmental science, if it asks, describe an environmental problem here, do not talk about humans. If it asks for societal benefits, you're talking about people, groups of people, right? Cities, crops, farms, 
That's what a societal a societal benefit or cost would be. Societies are groups of people, cities, countries. That's a society. If it asks about human health effects, you're going to talk about asthma, emphysema, nervous system issues like birth defects, brain damage, or cancer. That's pretty much most of the environmental health hazards. If you know the exact effect, write the correct effect. Otherwise, just take a guess. If it's asking about human health effects of some kind of air pollutant, odds are there's going to be some respiratory problems like asthma. Um, if it's asking for an economic benefit or cost, you're talking about money or jobs. What would be an economic benefit of your solution? Say you have a solution, you propose your solution and it asks for an economic benefit. It's going to create jobs. That's a solution. Or what would be an economic uh, cost to this pro to this solution. Well, it might actually reduce jobs. It might increase the amount of money a country makes, or it might lower the amount of money a country can make. You're talking about money and jobs with economics. If it asks what the government can do, the government can really only do three things. The government can make a law, the government can increase taxes, um, and the government can educate the public. And that's always one that's actually not talked about that much, but it is a really good one. Educating the public of an issue is one of the best things a government can do to get something done about that issue. Now, remember, when you're talking about, you know, taxes, if it says, what is an incentive the government could provide? Tax breaks or providing subsidies. What is something the government can do to stop people from doing this thing? They could increase the taxes. For instance, what's something the government could do to, to decrease the amount of gasoline consumed? Well, if they increase the tax on gasoline, less people would use gasoline because it would cost more money. Subsidies, remember, are where the government usually gives tax breaks or provides direct money to encourage a company or a group to do something. Now, Sometimes they want you to show both sides of an argument. So for example, they might say, describe one incentive of the government of a company that a government of a country could offer its citizens that would favor a reduction in the growth rate of a population. Explain how this incentive would work and describe one possible drawback. This kind of question is looking for you to be able to play devil's advocate. The idea being you're able to take the positive side of your idea, but also see what the negative side what the negative side could be. Any solution that you can think of that you're going to propose, you should be able to identify a possible drawback, something that could possibly go wrong, something that could possibly harm. Maybe you want to create a company that composts um, food waste from everyday people, right? One possible drawback to that could be less organic waste going to the landfill will reduce the amount of biodegradation occurring in the landfill. So now you've taken something that, in all honesty, is probably a good solution, but you're also looking at something that could possibly go wrong or could possibly be a negative unintended consequence. Typically, you want to go with the most obvious answer. They're not going to give you extra points because you know some obscure fact or law that you learned about on Discovery Channel. You want to try to give the answer that most of the nation will give. When they create the rubric to grade these, what they do is they the graders get together and read the questions. And then the graders write down what they think the answers are going to be. And then all the graders get together and they compare the answers that they came up with. And anything that most of those graders came up with, they will then say, okay, that's an answer. That's an answer we're going to accept. They don't make the answer guide before you actually take the test. They make the answer guide after you've taken the test. They also typically add answers to the rubric as they're grading. So if they start grading and they get through, say, 2,000 different, grade, uh, different responses and they start saying that most students are saying this thing, and it is technically correct, but it's not on our rubric. But there's a lot of students that are saying it. They're going to add it to the rubric. So you want to make sure that you're giving the answer that is most likely the correct answer. If there are more than one possible 
uh, answer, which usually that's true. We've seen the rubrics for the FRQs. There's usually many possibilities. You want to make sure you're giving the most obvious possibility, because if it's the most obvious, it's going to be on the rubric. And if you don't know a law, if it's asking you to talk about a law, always fall back on the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, or the Clean Water Act. Those typically work if you can support the answer. Remember that the Endangered Species Act protects certain species. The Clean Air Act puts regulations on pollutants in the air. The Clean Water Act regulates the pollutants in water. Now, you will see a problem that has an experimental design. So these are the tips to help you with experimental design. You want to make sure that you describe what outcomes are expected. You're going to have to give a hypothesis, and the hypothesis has to be testable. A good hy hypothesis is something that you can test. When you're creating your design and your experiment, make sure that it's possible and consistent with what is required. So if you're coming up with some kind of solution that has an experiment that you're going to test with, you have to make sure that that experiment is something that's not ridiculous, right? We're going to monitor all air pollutants in the city of Los Angeles. That's impossible. So you want to make sure, remember, that you control your experiment by making, that's how you make an experiment possible, by controlling it, controlling the variables. You will be asked to identify the independent and dependent variable. Remember that independent, if you remember dry mix, dry mix is a great way to remember how to um, graph, but D-R-Y-M-I-X. D-R-Y, dependent, responds on the y-axis. Mix, manipulated, independent on the x-axis. The independent is what you manipulate. It's the thing that you are changing. The dependent variable is what is going to um, respond. So typically, the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. Constants are things that you keep the same, things that you do not change so that they are not variables. And your control is typically under no experimental values. I'm not going to increase the amount of pollution to this rat, that's my control rat. That's the rat under normal circumstances without any of my experiment. Describe how you're gonna collect, graph, and analyze your data. If you talk about how you're gonna average data, that's considered analysis. So just remember that if you're going to have an experiment, you have to explain how you're going to collect that data, how you're going to analyze that data, and what you're going to, how you're going to make sense of it. And then you're going to talk about how you're going to make conclusions. So you want to talk about specifically what, and this was part of that, pro, that uh, project that we did. I, I tried to use these tips in that project so that you would be graded, um, and hopefully it would guide you towards creating a good experiment. The idea being that you should be able to talk about what results will you consider a success? What results are you looking for? What would prove your hypothesis? But also, what will disprove your hypothesis? And then always, always, always talk about how you're going to repeat the experiment. Because doing an experiment one time is never going to be considered a good experiment. You have to be able to verify your results. You should do the experiment multiple times to find out if your results are consistent. So more trials will be conducted. You could literally just say, hey, we're going to conduct this experiment a minimum of 50 times to, con to, to ensure consistent data collection. All right, so we're going to look at just those two questions specifically now. Uh, the question one is going to be 60% of your exam weight. You're going to do this one first. You're going to get 25 minutes to read the, the question and respond, and then you'll get five minutes to upload and submit. This is your investigation. You're designing an investigation. You're creating an experiment sometimes. You're going to be presented with an authentic environmental scenario accompanied by either a model or visual representation or quantitative data and it may assess your ability to describe and or explain environmental concepts, processes, and models presented in written format. 
analyze visual representations or data, analyze research studies that test environmental pr uh, principles, meaning that they might actually give you data from an experiment that was conducted and you have to be able to analyze those results so that you can show the, the environmental principles that we've learned. And then describe environmental problems and or possible responses. So looking at an experiment, and being able to say these are some of the problems or responses an environmental system may have. When you're done with the first question, you'll upload it. Once you've uploaded and submitted question one, you will move on to question two. You will not be able to go back to question one. So do not submit until you know for sure that you are completed with the question because you cannot go back to that question. Question two is the shorter question. You're going to have 15 minutes to read and respond and then five minutes to upload and submit. This is going to be a problem where you're going to analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution. Again, you're going to be presented with an authentic environmental scenario accompanied by either a model or visual representation or quantitative data. The big difference here is you're going to propose and justify solutions to the environmental problems. So this is something where you need to be prepared to propose and justify. Justify meaning you're probably gonna to have to look at the pros and cons of your solution to the environmental problems. So what now? I am going to put uh, some documents into a folder. If you go to Teams and go to the files for our general Teams uh, on uh, channel, you're gonna find a folder inside classroom materials that says FRQ prep or AP prep actually. Uh, there's gonna be a document there called all flowery statements on teams. Um, there are some prompts from each unit with practice of what are flowery wording questions, things that aren't really substantial. And you have an op opportunity to practice rewriting those answers in a more concise way. Um, I'm not collecting this. This is 100% your practice. I will provide an answer key or I will do a video on some possible answers because there might be more than one way to answer it. And you can absolutely uh, send yours to me if you would like specifically for me to look at it after you've looked at the solutions. If you're saying, hey, is this a good one? Um, I'm also going to put up unit reviews for units one through seven um, in the coming weeks. So you know, if we go back to school, it'll be great because we'll go through them in class. But if not, then I will either do videos or an answer key. But these are reviews for each unit, one through seven, that hopefully will help you review for all of the uh, material that could be included on the exam. And then the biggest thing, the College Board review on YouTube that they've got, they've got videos for all of the units. And if they're not there yet, they're working on it, they're uploading. I highly recommend that you watch those videos. They have tips and tricks for the FRQ specifically for this year, and they're reviewing all the content that we've learned. So I highly recommend that you watch those videos. Um, the College Board is literally giving you information on how to pass the test for this year. So to not use those videos would be very, very, uh, that would be a very poor choice. Now, on Thursday, we're going to have an FRQ practice. I'm gonna have two FRQs, uh, hopefully designed just like the two that we're gonna take. We're gonna use peergrade.io. We've used this before, but hopefully you still have the ability to log in. Um, make sure that you can log into your account on Peergrade, and if you can't, you need to email me um, so that we can get you set up and get your account opened again, because I want everybody to do this. Um, we're going to take the FRQs on Thursday. That's going to be our assignment for Thursday. And then on Friday, I'll open peer grading and you'll have from Friday all the way to the following Tuesday. So that's technically our assignment for Monday next week um, to peer grade and you'll peer grade your peers. The rubric will be provided um, and we'll have an opportunity to kind of look at each other's responses. You'll get a chance to practice grading because as you guys hopefully have realized by now, the practice of grading is one of the best ways to prepare for an FRQ because if you're writing your answers as if you were you know, thinking about the person that's grading it, you're going to do better. Um, make sure to ask questions and have discussions on teams. You know, we have a lot of really bright students in this class that I think would be 
Very happy to help you if you are struggling, if there's anything that you need help with, use Teams. And I will be responding to discussions as well if you guys have any questions on there. Also, tomorrow, April 22nd, just in case you didn't know, is Earth Day. Super exciting. Um, we were actually, if we were in school, we would have probably done something. Uh, this was when I was planning on doing our little, like, uh, you know, little hike or something. Um, either we were going to do it on the Tuesday or Thursday around Earth Day. But anyways, um, I've looked, I've reached out to a production company that's made a documentary called The Story of Plastic, and they're going to be airing the documentary on the Discovery Channel tomorrow. Um, but I'm working with them to get a free screening because they're, they're working with teachers to do free screenings. Um, so that you guys could all watch it online without having, if you didn't have television service. Um, so hopefully that'll happen. It might not be on Earth Day. It might happen in the coming weeks. But the key is that you'll be able to watch this documentary for free. Um, from what I've seen, it looks like it's going to be a really good one. Obviously, this isn't required. So just something to think about. Um, something else you can do on Earth Day Go for a clike or clogging in case you don't know what those are. That's that's hike and jogging, but you're cleaning up litter while you do it. Um, if you do that, make sure you wear gloves, make sure you wash your hands, wash your face afterwards, but it is a great way. Um, I take my dogs on walks just about every day. And whenever I go out on a walk with my dogs, I typically am picking up litter on the walking trails that we go around because people are savages. Um, the other thing you could think about, most of the garden stores are open, and like Moana Nursery and Home Depot and Lowe's. And if your family wants to get uh, a new plant or a tree, think about, you know, maybe having a little family outing. You guys go out in the front yard or the backyard and you plant something new for Earth Day. Get some more carbon sequestration. With that being said, that's everything I've got for you guys for FRQ Prep. Um Hopefully this video wasn't incredibly long and boring. Uh, if it was, I'm sorry. But I think everything in the video, everything with these tips is incredibly useful to help you guys get the best possible score on your FRQ because I want you guys all to get a five. Uh, stay safe. Smile. Go look at the kitten pictures that I've posted. Uh, we still have one left that isn't adopted yet. Believe it or not, of those four kittens, three have already been called out and picked. And hopefully you guys are doing well. I miss you guys very much. Uh, this is not the life for me. I need people. So I hope to see you all very soon. Thanks again.